You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. Then the pattern is financial asset inflation, crash, and then deflation. Every time for the next couple of decades, and I hope I'm around to enjoy them, we'll be focusing on the gold sector. It'll be the bull market. Welcome back to Mining Stock Education. I'm Bill Powers, your host. Thank you for tuning in. In January of this year, when I was at the VRIC conference, the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference, I was able to meet several new people. And my guest today is one of them. I was able to sit down and have lunch with Bob Hoy. He's well known in Vancouver and in the precious metals and junior resource investing community there and abroad. Uh, Bob has an extensive background as a geologist, so he understands rocks, but he also understands stocks because he has extensive experience in the financial side. Side of the business working for an investment dealer and he also understands history and charts so he has a service whereby he provides commentary of what's going on in the markets find more about bob on the internet at pivotaladvice.com or his other website is chartsandmarkets.com. So Bob, welcome back to Mining Stock Education. We did a brief interview as part of an episode back in January, but uh, this interview and this show is devoted today just to your thoughts. Let's start off with the inflation versus deflation debate. You wrote an article that you had sent over to me. Where do you stand on the inflation versus deflation debate? Oh yeah, boy, that one is really fascinating, Bill, because most people in the precious metals side learned what they know in the 1970s when it was finally recognized that the Federal Reserve was crazy, their policies were crazy, and they were going to do the printing press, and gold was going to go to many thousands of dollars. Um, if you're a silver bug, then silver will outperform, and similarly, if you're a copper bug, uh, it would be copper. So, but what? And, and this is where the gold bugs and the silver bugs have the same opinion as the central bankers. They really believe that currency depreciation saves everything, and the gold community is right in condemning them for this. But there's something else going on, and we call it sometimes Mother Nature or the public. And this is where history comes in. I, I don't have the imagination to stand at a pinnacle and say it's going to continue or discontinue. But what happens is when you have these huge speculative spikes and mathematically in computers, you can't solve equa these equations because they're skewed, skewed equations. Um, and, but you can solve them by looking at previous examples. So for all the decades I've been watching these financial markets, <laughs> I never came up with the following line. Uh, until just a couple of weeks ago on a piece that I was writing. And most people are familiar with 1929 and the crash and all that sort of stuff. But most don't understand that there were four, count them, four 1929s before 1929. The first bubble was the South Sea bubble in 1720. And the public, without instruction from anywhere, created a fantastic financial bubble and took it to a peak in June of that year in London, and then it crashed. So these recurred. So what I noticed a long time ago was these recurring patterns. So, And then specifically, the change was the last really big peak of CPI inflation was in 1980, 81, when the CPI rate got to 15%. But there was one before that in 1920, and the U.S. CPI rate of inflation got to 23%. But then the other thing I noticed was that uh, when you had those big global commodity booms, they were followed by a global commodity crash, and then by speculation in financial assets. So this is what happens. The public will spend a decade speculating in tangible assets like commodities the stocks and bonds go the other way and then there's this subtle transition like 1920 the 1921 crash in commodities was a horror show 
And so that through the 1920s, the Federal Reserve was very worried about pricing power for business. There wasn't enough inflation in the system, so the Fed was easy with credit, pushing all kinds of it in whenever they felt like. But they did not understand that then the public chooses to play in the financial markets, and away it went. And then you had the uh, stock market peak in that September, and then the public chose to focus on cash once the deflation started. So, And th- this is important, because I looked at the transition in 1980, and this is where Paul Volcker was then head of the Fed, and he was celebrated for personally ending inflation. But if you knew about the inflation that ended in 1980, you knew it was market forces. But if you take a look at the money supply growth figures, late 70s, early 80s, and into the mid 80s, there was no change. So the Fed did not tighten. What happened was the commodities crashed, and then it set up a financial bubble. So here we go. There was a peak in commodities in 2008, and then another in 2011. And then that then set up a period of, well, during they blamed it on Obama's policies, which were bad policies and did curb economic activity, but it was slow growth. So then we all know that through uh, most of that decade, period of the Obama administration, the policymakers were very concerned about not enough inflation. You had to get it above 2%. So then they were easy and deliberately easy and uh, under the same conditions that the Fed faced in the 1920s. And the same thing happened. You had a a stock bubble. Um, Now, on the near term on, on this bill in Early October, our work, uh, we had a what we call a springboard buy on the stock market. So we thought, hey, this thing can rally out till the uh, maybe January because there have been a number of terrific speculations conclude in the January period. Uh, one, of course, on the gold and silver side was the mania that completed in January of 1980 and crashed hard. Also, in the, end, the last trading day of 1989 was when the fabulous Nikkei bubble compl- completed. And then there was a very good bull market that completed in January 1973 and was followed by the worst bear market since the 1930s. So this is where we then said, okay, possible peak in January. And what we needed was to have the market excited enough that it was pushing our technical indicators, which it did. We had had upside exhaustions and sequential sells on the important things. So in early January, one was not aware of what the threat was from the uh, Wuhan flu problem. So I actually wrote that this could be an important top, and uh, we have a sequential sell, and we haven't got a clue as to what the story would be for explaining a decline. said <laughs> The media would come up with the story after the decline started. So the, then came the uh, pandemic, and with that, unbelievable moves to authoritarian uh, governments in any jurisdiction, state, um, provincial, or federal, or municipal, just something awful. So Bob, would you consider that Even though the Fed and injection of liquidity has propped back up the general equities, are you saying that you do not contend as being able to inflate the general equities? Yeah, you got it. So you're short general equities, and are you long commodities? Mm -hmm. Would that be the takeaway? Well, we've been we've been long since uh, I think it was March third on on stocks, and March sixth we got the buy on gold, which was the exact opposite to the sell on gold in 2011. So got pretty excited about gold. But the rebound is a natural rebound, and uh, we did one the other day called sell in May and go away. So that would be on the general stock market and junk bonds and that sort of stuff. So we've had a natural rebound, but you're right to bring in the question about the ability of the Fed to reflate the economy. 
And this is a wonderful theory. It's very attractive. As a matter of fact, the promo- promoters originally of the Fed in the early 1900s knew that a financial crisis preceded a recession. So they then had the Fed with its lender of last resort, they used that phrase then, that would prevent rece- uh, the financial setbacks that preceded recessions. And all you have to do is say, there's been 18 recessions since the Fed was formed in 1913, so the theory doesn't work. Now, also, uh, there's been quite a bit of um, misinformation about what the Fed was doing in 1929 and 1930. And uh, in August of 1929, when the Fed raised the uh, their discount rate from 5% to 6%, they, they were concerned about too much speculation in Wall Street. But what they were doing, and there's a... Uh, New York Times story on it from, I think, August the 17th, 1929, the uh, Fed was going to ease money to Wall Street. So it didn't really deliberately tighten. But what happened is at the end of every bubble, the markets automatically tightened. Now, another tidbit from the crash of 1929 is that the, uh, the Fed stepped into the market. And the New York Fed, of course, was the key action. And they bought bonds out of the market. And they, uh, the New York Fed exceeded its authority by a factor of six times. So <laughs> it was pumping money into the market. And then in 19, Feb- I think it was February 1930, one of the Fed spokesmen said that they had met the panic in the classic way by uh, providing all kinds of liquidity. So then you move ahead to July of 1932, which was the low on that bear market, the first bear market. And Barron's had a wonderful editorial that said that every anti-deflationary measure by the Fed is seen not to be working. And the, and they also outlined the anti-deflationary measures was buying bonds out of the market, which they were still doing. So uh, they um, it doesn't work. The notion that liquidity from somewhere will make a liquidity contraction go away has been around since Edward Misseldon first came out with it in 1622. There was a crash that started in 1618 and there was hardship with high unemployment. So Misseldon said that if there was more money, interest rates would be lower and uh, there'd be uh, everything would be fine. So why is gold, Bob, I guess the question would be, why is gold going up? Because if Uh-oh. that's what gold bugs yeah. look okay, to... Okay, well, that one is easy to explain, too, because in in a, in each of these five previous 1929s, the real price of gold went down. By the real price, you adjust it for the rate of inflation. So real price of gold goes down in a bubble, and the last high for the real price of gold was in 2011, and it came down and it set... a a, a good base in 2018, and since it has established a very strong rising trend, this is good stuff, because the reason why gold goes up in a post-bubble contraction is because the liquidity, the the uh, the careful money goes to the most liquid items. The most liquid items are the U.S. Treasury market, one year and shorter, and the other liquid item is gold. But what about those that would argue, well, the liquid items are Facebook, Amazon, and Netflix? <laughs> That's if you're, if you're focused on equities. And they have been remarkable vehicles. And you've got the world buying those. And particularly, uh, many central bankers have switched over to modern portfolio theory. And instead of keeping their reserve in gold or short-term instruments, they have been buying the stock market. And when they buy the stock market, they buy the most liquid items. So... Liquidity went out of the stock market at the right time. Now, what we have been doing for our subscribers, Bill, is focusing on the underlying path, which has been the peak of speculation in the bubble. And I said that the the real price of gold is confirming that we are in a post-bubble contraction. And then if you take a look at real long interest rates for lower grade bonds um, and the a real again as you adjust the interest rate for the rate of inflation and the that real interest rates on every great bubble have come down to a very important low i think there were three in, no two instances where the real long interest rate went minus one year it was minus 5 and i think it was minus 5 but anyways 
And then the other part, so real long interest rates and coming down with the bubble was a feature of every bubble. And then real long interest rates turn up, which they have. Well, one of the other thing in the interest rate market is uh, the yield curve, which is the difference between long rates and short rates. It, it inverted in the summer 2019. And I've got the chart on the yield curve back to 1860. And there is one conclusion that you can make from looking at the curve and every inversion where short rates have risen higher than long rates has been followed by a recession, everyone. And then, of course, what happened is with the speculative thrust late in the year, the curve inverted again. So then I know that when was the last time that the curve inverted twice as a speculative mania was concluding? Well, it was 2007. And that was an important one. And then the one prior to that was 1929, double inversion. And then the one before that was 1873, which was a huge bubble. Now, 1873 can also get us onto the liquidity thing and deflation thing. So are you expecting deflation in, let's say, housing? In oh, yeah, food, everything. In food, in autos, and yep. everything we yep. buy Every, in the real world? Yeah, yeah. Even gold stocks or gold stocks? No, no. Here's, this, is the, this is the amazing thing. But just let me finish that in 1873, at the height of that boom, the New York and uh, New York newspaper, the Herald, editorialized that nothing could go wrong because the United States did not have a central bank. That was a big plus because it had the they called the national banking system. Sometimes they called the treasury system. And the edit, editor, the editorial said the reason why nothing could go wrong is because with the treasury system not constrained by gold, the the treasury could buy any amounts of bonds and put unlimited amounts of liquidity into the market. And the 1873 to 1895 was a classic post-bubble um, contraction. And in England, which was the main economy, the uh, economists in 1884 looked at how weak things were and started calling it, guess what, the Great Depression. And it lasted until 1895, and senior economists in England, as late as 1939, were still analyzing the Great Depression and how it could have been prevented. That was the 1873 to 1895 Depression. So here's the pattern, and it's repeated, and this is now the sixth time, a long period of economic expansion, ending with about a decade of, of uh, speculation in commodities, tangible assets, high inflation, and then that goes crash. And then you have a new financial era where its financial asset goes up until it gets blowout and crashes. So the blowout was January, and there's no question we've had a hard hit to the stock markets. Now, favorites and some high-tech stocks are look like they're getting back to the old highs. But if you take a look at the New York Stock Exchange comp, it's not such a happy story. So the then the pattern is financial asset inflation, crash, and then deflation every time. And we know that certainly since the 1873, 1860s, 1870s, the system, the banking system in New York and the banking and the central bank in, in London uh, attempted to keep bubbles going. And because uh, you see in 1873, that's when Walter Badgett, who was the highly esteemed editor of The Economist, and he wrote a book called Lombard Street, and in it he said that contractions can be prevented by the central bank being accommodating and easy. So, Bob, how long will this deflationary situation take place? If I look at, like, say, real estate prices here where I live in Metro Detroit, they crashed in 2008, and then they bottomed around, like, 2010. So there was two years of just... Uh, deflation in the, the the housing market that nobody would have foreseen that it got that bad. So how long do you expect there to be a deflationary situation and, and how will gold stocks perform in this deflation? Each of the post-bubble contractions has been about 20 years. And each, of course, the three to four year business cycle continued, but you had 
weak recoveries and severe recessions. But what makes gold go is the um, the real price goes up, and it has to do with the contra- credit contraction that's going on in a financial bubble. Credit expands, and in the contraction and in, in the depression, it contracts. So. I attribute the brilliance to Mother Nature, and she can't stand a a vacuum. So as the usual and also the fanciful instruments of credit contract, severe hardships, but the real price of gold goes up because everything is deflating relative to the price of gold. And it rises, it improves profit margins. And you just look at a mining company today, about one-third of its operating costs are due straight straight energy costs, which relates to the price of uh, crude oil. One-third is operating and blasting agents and chemicals and all that sort of stuff, which relates to crude oil. So with crude crashing, and by the way, last year our target for some time in the future was $27 on crude on annual averages. So miners are now beginning to see that their their profitability is improving, and it doesn't matter what the price of gold does, so long as the real price goes up. So this then has the, some of the greatest bull markets for gold stocks have been in the post bubble depressions, because it's the only game that you can forecast ahead of time that will be profitable. There will be things going on in the high tech side that you can't predict or anticipate, but the one thing that history shows is that every post-bubble deflation has been the uh, the environment for a fabulous bull market in gold stocks. So this, I'm, I'm extremely bullish on the long term, but the problem is, as we've seen, the uh, gold stocks got whacked with the big stocks earlier in the year. But the the big thing we use on guiding us at important highs and lows in the sector is the silver gold ratio and on any bull market silver rallies more than gold so the the ratio changes and what we do is we uh, put the RSI a weekly RSI on it which is a momentum thing and in April of 2011 under that terrific bull market the RSI got up as high as 90 and the only other time it had been as high as 90 was in January 1980 at the top of that mania. So we advised that it was the sector was overdone, speculative, and dangerous, and have been bearish on it. So and I've kept wondering through the last couple of years now, how in the hell can we get the sector sold off enough so that it's the opposite of what happened in 2011? That was sort of my technician's mind idling away and my emotional side was saying, no, it could never get that bad. <laughs> and then bang, in it came. And the uh, the silver-gold ratio went down, I think it was March the 6th to 11, which was as bad as it ever gets. So it was the opposite of the high in 2011, which we advised. And we said, this this is the V buy signal on the sector, on stocks. Now, for the next couple of decades, and I hope I'm around to enjoy them, we'll be focusing on the gold sector. It'll be the bull market, but of course you'll have to, there are times when it's going to get over-speculated in, and um, some of the individual stocks now have been pretty hot and are getting kind of toppy. So, But basically our theme since earlier in the year was to buy the golds and then buy the dips and on the big stock market, it was to sell the rallies and not buy the dips, except for if you're a good quick trader. You know, we had the uh, uh, March, early March when we came out with a piece, special piece saying that the worst is in uh, uh, and it could bottom soon. No, that was March 16th, and I think the low was the 23rd or something like that. As we bring our conversation to a close, I have one question for you that came in from a listener, and they asked, do I think Canada would seize the gold mines or some of the gold mines that are in your country, considering that your central bank doesn't have gold already. Um, might you give us a brief answer? What do you think here as a Canadian? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, the federal government has gone crazy, a socialist uh, uh, recently. And I think then to buy the gold sector would be highly unlikely. 
I think they're screwing up so badly that uh, a popular uprising in Canada is a way overdue, and I think uh, it's it's possible. So the uh, a popular uprising would um, would really uh, improve the political attitudes in Canada. But we used to call the Canadian dollar a commodity in a commodity currency, but not anymore because resource mining of commodities such as base metals, precious metals, and hydrocarbons are just not allowed. And where they're going to get the money to pay for huge projects, I don't know. But Canada is very eligible for a popular uprising that would begin a lengthy reform of excessive and intrusive and unbelievably costly government. It's a good question, though. Uh, I don't see them nationalizing gold mines. Uh, They attempted to nationalize the petroleum industry back when Trudeau Sr., and I don't think they're going to. They they all hate the petroleum industry. That I doubt it would nationalize it. So, and they hate the gold. So I doubt that they'd nationalize that. I'm looking for a reform in Canada, and back to more free market solutions. Thank you for your commentary there. To learn more about Bob's uh, services, uh, his analysis, go to pivotaladvice.com or his other website is chartsandmarkets.com. Bob, thanks for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. Hey, Bill, it's a pleasure working with you. Thank you.